So today we're going we're to go somewhere a little bit different today. And, uh, and then, well, we were going to start a new series today called what I'm going to call the C3 series. And what I want to talk about is, you know, we're doing some new things up here. We're experimenting some new things. I don't know exactly where it's all going to go. I, I, I like the sound, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're going through different things and trying to find a way what's, what's the best way to present the Lord and the best way to enter into worship and different things. But also, how our church is, you know, we need to find a way now. We've, we've been together now for a little bit over a year. I'm going to spend this next year developing what our image is. You know, I don't want to be known as just First Assembly of God come to church. Who are we? What type of people, what do we need to be in order to express that into the world? What do we need to express to somebody who needs to hear about Jesus Christ? Because you know something? They know who Jesus is. We talked a few weeks ago, Jesus is a cuss word in our, in our society now, is it not? You know, they, they know who he is, and, and because he's a cuss word, it's, it's not even like an important thing anymore. And we need to find a way to say, why do you need to come to that Jesus? And we're going to talk about over the next three weeks after this, we're going to talk about these three C's, what I think we should be known about. Caring for each person, connecting each story, and celebrating every miracle. And we're going to talk about each C over the next three weeks. And this week I was going to talk about caring and what care means. And, and Wednesday I was putting together the message and, and God was really moving. It was great. And I was done Wednesday before church. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to have a wonder. This is going to, this is going to be like such an easy end of the week. It's awesome. And then God spoke to me and said, that's for next week. Lord, man, okay, all right, all right, all right. And, and then he started laying out, says, see, it works out really good. And what we're going to do is the next three weeks, we're going to talk about the three C's. And the first week of October, we're going to have our missions convention. And to give you a couple weeks to mull over them. Then October 8th, we're going to have a different service. We're going to have a short service. I'm going to have a short message, but it's going to really be inspired. You're going to get to know yourself that day. It's going to be really different. And it's going to be, because we really need to, to get ourselves to know who we are, what we are, where we're going, and who you are yourself so we can deal with one another and be able to go together as one united front rather than a bunch of individuals trying to make something happen. And so we're going to, and then that day, and then after, and it's going to be done about 11 o'clock. Yeah, I know you're saying, yeah, pastor can't get done by 11 o'clock. There's no way pastor can get done by 11 o'clock. Trust me, I'm going to make sure we get done by 11 o'clock. Do I know how that's going to happen yet? No. Will it happen? Absolutely. Because at 11 o'clock, we're going to have, I'm going to have a, we're going to just have a, just a, a family meeting. We're going to talk about what you think about some of the changes. There'll be a couple other wrinkles in the next few weeks. We're going to talk about um, the three C's. What do you think about the three C's? Because really, you got to understand what they all are about. So make plans to be here the next three weeks, okay? If you're not here, look online and, and check it out on Facebook as we publish the sermons each week and things like that. We have a lot of things that are going on because... You know what? I, I want to present ourselves in a way that makes sense to people. And we're also October 8th, we're going to put out there that day, we're going to talk about our name. All right? And uh, you've all read the letter. I'm thinking about changing our name. Now, not our official name, because that gets really expensive really fast. But what we call ourselves. You know, there's the First Baptist Church. There's the First Methodist Church. There's the First Church of God. There's the First Assembly of God. You know what? What happens if there was a Second Assembly of God or Second Baptist? Who wants to be known as Second or third, or fourth, you know, you know, you know and, and first to me kind of seems like a little elitism, we're, we're, we're the, you know, yeah, we serve the best kind of, but what, but does that inspire someone to want to come here, does it inspire someone to come be here, what are we, who are we, what do we want to project ourselves at, and all I do is on the eighth to start talking about that, first of all, do you like the three C's, I think you will, and they really talk about who we are, and then talk about how do we project ourselves out of the community? What, what do people need to hear? Because you know what? People don't need to hear about Jesus and know who he is. They need to know what, how he will make a change in their life. Does that make sense? They're looking for that change. I mean, spiritualism is everywhere. People are looking for something. But, you know, they gotta, there's got to be that reason to come here. And, that, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're not going to make a change that day. Some people are like, oh, we're going to changing it. No, it's just going to have a meeting. We're just going to talk. Friendly way. Hopefully it's friendly. Uh, but, you know, we're just going to talk about it, and then, uh, and then we're going to work towards it. Maybe put some ideas out there over the next few months. And then in February at our annual business meeting, that's when we will vote on whether we want to do something like that because we need to have an official meeting. But I, wanna, I don't want this to be something we do overnight, something just like that. Because, you know, when we do things just like that, it, it tends to, to turn people off and do things like that. I want us to spend some time praying about it, coming up with it. And, and seeing where we're going to go with that, because we want to be something that really inspires people. We want to and say, hey, let's proud who we are. You know, you know pride is a good, there's good, there's good pride and there's bad pride, okay? You know what? We should be proud of our God, right? Of what he's done for us. And the point that we want to share him with everybody else, 
but we need something to help us with that. You know, why I come here? What's, what's going to make it different? And, and I think that's where we need to go from. You know, we, the church has been the same for about 30 years. I mean, last week when we did the change, people were here like, man, that's totally different. Now, we had different colors last week. Just so you know, if you weren't here last week, I'm experimenting. I don't know what the, the background colors are going to be. Last week it was like a purplish color, a, red, a reddish purple. This week I have a blue and purple. And I'll, I'll be experimenting in a few weeks different colors. If you don't like a color, tell me. Don't go home and tell somebody else. I mean, I, I, I'm a guy. <laughs> All right? All right? Guys are not known for color pals to the, mo- to the most end, okay? All right? What looks good to me might not look good. So I'm just trying to see what, what's going to be the most pleasing and what's going from that point of view. And then eventually going to expand out to the sides and all that and do different things because we want to make God's house the best that it can be. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. So today, we're, we're not doing that today. Today we're going to go over, we're gonna, I'm going to have a follow-up from last week because last week we, we talked about a heavy subject. We talked about this verse here. For your name's sake, O Lord, Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Uh, now, earlier I had to raise the hands to see who was and who wasn't here last week because I wanted to also kind of see, you know, how much review I got to do. And uh, so I'm going to do a quick review. Yes, by the word quick, I mean under five minutes. Okay, a lot of you hear me say quick and you don't think I can do it. Today's going to, I'm going to hopefully change a little bit of that today. But here's what's going on is basically last week I talked about the Day of Atonement and forgiveness. But forgiveness goes beyond just forgiving someone because you can just forgive somebody, right? You, you, and, but saying you forgive them and actually doing through it, what does it mean to really truly forgive somebody? And the word actually is pardon. And, and pardons, when, when do we hear about pardons from last week? When, when's the most, when do we usually hear about pardons? Anybody remember? Presidents, when they're going out, they pardon a whole bunch of people. Sometimes for political gain, sometimes for financial reasons, sometimes it's because they're their friend. And they don't have to answer anybody for it because it's the right as the president. Bill Clinton pardoned 396 people in his last couple months in office. George Bush pardoned 171 his last months of office. Anybody remember how many Obama did? 1,715. And 504 of them were on death row. But you know what? He got to do that simply because he was the president. He didn't have to answer to anybody. You know, he's going out. You know why? Because he had to care because he wasn't getting reelected. He's done. He can't get reelected. After when you're done, your secretary, if you're done, you can't come back in. So he had no fear of the public for doing this. And he could do it because it was his right. And when Jesus forgives us, the point was that Jesus, he pardons us. And he does it for no other reason than he wants to be your friend. He loves you no matter what you've done. He loves you despite of yourself. He loves you so much. And when he forgives you, he doesn't just forgive the sin, but he pardons you. And what this pardon means, it means restores you back to where you were. See, when the president pardons somebody, they don't just get out of jail. They get to go back to what they were doing. Well, that's, 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 that's crazy, isn't it? And that's why there's controversy. How can you let him go back and be the same rotten, dirty person he was? The president doesn't have to answer to you because he's out of office and he doesn't need your vote anymore. Not that he really listened to you while he's in office, but, you know, that's a whole different story. That was a joke. You guys do follow our American politics, right? You elect somebody. They usually do what they, you tell them to do? Uh, okay, okay. I'm sure we're living in the same country here. All right. But you know what? You know, but you have all these different things going on. But pardoning means that you restore. When Jesus forgives you, he restores you to where you were. Now, that's a hard concept for us to understand. And last week, I had a lot of people come up to me after church. And I had some people come to me during the week and tell me about different things that were going on in their lives. And, 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 and this, this is a hard thing to do. And, and so God was speaking to me and saying, you know, you need to unpack this a little bit more. So today we're going to talk a little bit about that, about how, how hard is it. Is that me? It's me. Hang on, mate. I must be a little too tight back here. Okay, I don't hear anything now. All right. Hey, you got to do what you got to do, right? We'll edit that out of the video, Kevin, uh, just so you know. All right. So as, as we go on, we got all this stuff going on. But before I go on, I want to give you a... Okay, this is not... Huh? Check the plug. Okay. Oh, it is loose. Okay, it's the jacket. Something's wrong with the jacket. Okay, no, it's not the jacket. Okay, all right. Okay, I need. Gonna, okay, Keith, Kevin, Keith, we're gonna. Um, today, 
I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to talk from my heart. Just say so you no. Know, this is all I have. Normally, I have like 10, 11 pages up here. But before we get going, I want to share with you uh, uh, the video I showed last week. Who was here last week again? Was that a powerful video? Well, you have about 20 or 30 weren't here last week, so I want to show it one more time. Is that okay? 13. Chris Williams, C-H-R-I-S-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. On February 9th, 2007, my family was hit by a drunk teenage driver. And killed in that accident was my wife, Michelle, who was expecting our fifth child, and then my second oldest son, Benjamin, and my only daughter, Anna. Friday night, like any other in our family, it was full of fun. We'd gone out to dinner as a family, and my oldest son was off with friends. I saw a pair of headlights coming at me at incredibly fast rate of speed, so as I tried to do some maneuvers to get out of the way, it was, it was too late. We were hit broadside or T-boned. As I surveyed the scene um, and saw my wife, I saw her chest go down and her last breath um, leave her body, and I wanted to cry out for her to come back. The next sound I heard was of me wailing and grieving the fact that they were gone. It was as near to an out-of-body experience as I could have, listening and realizing that I was the one making that sound. I've never felt so uh, vulnerable in my life. I've never felt so crushed um, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. If you have a teenager out past midnight, you don't like to receive a call. I got up and took the phone, and on the other end of the line, a man identified himself as uh, being from the Salt Lake City Police Department. Told us that he had our son Cameron. Told us that Cameron was intoxicated, that uh, he'd been in an accident, but he was okay. And he told us as a result of the accident that three people had been killed. found out that uh, Sam was the child who had survived. So we went up to the university hospital where Chris's family uh, were there. Even at that moment, you know, we're all, we're all blubbering and crying, and Chris is laying on the, uh, the gurney in a neck brace, and one of the first things he asks is, how is the young man who was driving the other car? You know, for the first few months after the accident, I felt, I think it was just the initial shock, that such a huge part of my life was now gone. And that's a very difficult thing to go through, to kneel down and desire to speak to my Father in Heaven when I'm so lonely or when I'm so anguished. It's an interesting conversation to have. You know, he doesn't immediately um, try and make it better. He listens to me first. And I thought that was very helpful. He allowed me to get that anger off my chest. But inevitably, he would always come back and teach me about his son, Jesus Christ. When I did feel anger, or there was just a deep sense of loneliness, I didn't direct that at the person that had caused this. It directed itself at the Savior. As I looked out, the driver's window and saw the overturned car that had hit us and struck us. You know, I, in my heart I didn't know and in my mind I didn't understand or comprehend still how it had happened um, or who had done it to us or, or what the circumstances were. The only thing I remember feeling and sensing is that I needed to let this go. There's Jesus's way to resolve problems, to address situations, to handle uh, sorrow. And then there's some other way. It's something that I think Chris clued into early in life. And so when the moment came for him in that car, sitting there, I believe he had made the decision long ago what he would do if he was ever in that situation. 
about a year ago, Chris and, and Cameron met for the first time and talked. The first time that I met him, I was in a room and he walked in and he had a big smile on his face. And I had no smile because I, I'm facing the man you know, that I had done this to. He came and he gave me a handshake. He was completely willing to talk about what had happened that night, how he felt about it. Chris was able to say things that Cameron needed to hear. And he didn't mince words. He let him know how he was feeling, what it meant. He wants me to let go of what had happened. He wants me to pick a date and forget what had happened, just move on from what had happened completely. There was no way to explain it. It's, it's, it's an overwhelming feeling of, of thankfulness, of gratefulness, of strength to, to see him and, and to see how he's acted in this situation. After we went to the funeral, one of our neighbors that was at the funeral came up to us and said, have you read the article about Chris? And it was his article about forgiveness. My feeling was is that I was just completely overcome with, it was like being washed out, the despair was being washed out from my soul. And knowing that somebody like that could so freely forgive, just it was freeing to me to know that he could respond in that fashion. The thought and sentiment I expressed as I sat down with Cameron was simply this, that if through the forgiveness or through anything else he had seen or heard about me doing after the accident, that he should know it was merely the Savior working through me. I had merely put myself in a situation to be a vessel through which the spirit, through which his example, through which his knowledge, his intelligence, his brilliance could shine. That's really all I had to do, was to not get in the way of that. I wanted him to understand that I really didn't have much to do <laughs> with any of the goodness that has come out of that. It's become more significant to me, the fact that he had forgiven me. And I know that's because he knows and he has a, a testimony and a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm grateful that God allows tragedies and trials to occur in our lives. Not because they're easy or because they're desired, but because they help us love. And that too was a wonderful blessing because I saw my brother. coming to know a man of sorrow and one who is acquainted with grief. As I've now come to understand, it is really why I was sent here. And it has been incredibly difficult to have to learn those lessons in the way that I've learned them. But I've always ended those episodes of grief with an assurance and a hope that one day, perhaps I will see him as he is. One day, hopefully, I will be like him. And one day I will be with my wife again, as well as the rest of my family. And that's what keeps me moving forward. This guy in this story is amazing. You know, I talked about last week. He, he didn't just forgive the guy. He pardoned him and led him to Jesus. And now they're friends. But the interesting thing you got to know about the story is that it didn't just happen, like, overnight. And that's something that God was speaking to me about, uh, about last week, this week, because I talked to people. You know, um... Sometimes with this, this concept of pardon that we had last week, when you left the room, you could kind of hear a pin drop. Kind of was anticlimactic going into the picnic. Um, but, you know, it's something we got to think about. How, how Jesus wants us to pardon people. He doesn't want us just to forgive. And uh, the one theme I heard from different people, and different people really took it to heart, and different things that happened. And uh, the amazing thing is, is that um, what I heard was, this is a struggle. This is hard to do. And situation after situation, what about this person? What about this? What about this situation? How do we apply it to there? And, and God spoke to me and said, I want you to put that out there, but now you need to kind of unpack it. So I was praying to God about these things, and that's when God uh, said, yeah, I want you to talk on that this morning. And, and so I kind of took the word struggle, and I was telling God, you know, I, I preach this message, and I believe it, and I've been, pra I've been practicing with somebody in my life. I also have now gone to somebody else I need to go to, and I'm about to go to a, a third person with it. One person has received it well. The other person hasn't responded to me yet, and that's okay. And, and I was saying, but, Lord, that, I hear that word struggle, and the more I think about it, it's like one guy told me, 
you know, it's hard to get his brain wrapped around this, you know. And, and you know, it is, it is kind of hard to wrap your brain around it. I said, God, wh wh why isn't this easy? And then God said, you know what? He said, you know, it's a struggle for a reason. And the reason is, is simply because of this. I don't need my clicker anymore. He says it's a struggle because it helps you understand what Jesus did for you better. It's hard for us to forgive and pardon, but that's what Jesus does. As soon as you get saved, as soon as you give your sins to him, he not only forgives you, but he restores you to be a child of God, a masterpiece, that what he always intended you to be right away. Now think of that. We as humans, we, we can't do that. And that's what God wants you to know. Because one thing I heard is, man, I feel bad sometimes if I can't do this. What if I can't, am I a bad person? Am I a bad Christian? God wants you to know you're not bad if you can't do it right away because you can't. Humans, we can't because we're not God. We don't, we don't have that ability. But what God wants you to understand, we need to live the life of pardoning. You need to get better and better at it because it helps you appreciate what Jesus did for you better. You understand that? Does that make sense? Nod your heads or say something. But you know what? And, and so God was telling me, this is a lifestyle. we got to live. we got to do this. But every time you decide to struggle for you to forgive somebody and then also pardon them, restore them back in the relationship... Imagine that's what Jesus did for you when you sinned. And then when you sin again, you go back to him and say, God, forgive me again. He, he pardons you again and restores you back to the way you were. And he does it just like that. It should help you appreciate what he did on the cross for you a whole lot more. So the struggle is a good thing. Because you know something, I'll tell you one thing. If you don't struggle with this, you're the one of two things. You're either in heaven because you don't have to worry about it anymore. Or you're not trying hard enough. Because we're going to have people that hurt us. That's the way it's going to be. It's life. Okay? You're not going to ever get into a position in life where everybody loves you. You're always going to have somebody doesn't like you. And I had a conversation this week with one of my leaders. I was talking about leadership. And it's like, you know, leadership, you know, when you become the leader, if you ever become a leader at something, realize people aren't going to like you at some point. Just the way it is. Okay? Most people don't like the boss, do they? And that's just the way it is. But we got to live this way for a certain reason. And, 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 and so I want you here today, first I want you to know is I'm glad a lot of you are struggling with this because that shows that you're trying to get closer to God. It's you're trying, because we're supposed to live like Jesus did. And, and when, I, when, I, when I started talking about it, as I mentioned that last week, it's how we get, we got to imitate Jesus in all we do. Another verse came to mind, it was Matthew 5, 48, and it says this, Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's like, hey, I'm not perfect. That's a tough verse. And I was thinking about, Lord, I've, I've, I've preached on that verse. I've talked about that verse. But I've only never, I've never really given it the just duty that it needs to be done. And I was like, and God was saying, this is what I want out of you. I'm like, what? You know, I, 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 I ain't there yet. And then God brought to mind to me about, about sanctification, what we believe about that. Now, that's a, a word that we use in Christian circles. You know, a lot of people like to use that word. You got to be sanctified. You, know, you ever heard that? You know, it's one of those fun words that preachers like to use. But it doesn't mean a thing if you don't understand what it is. <laughs> and what it is, is what we believe is you get saved. And as soon as you get saved, you're holy before God. But we realize that you're going to make mistakes. Last week we talked about in 2 Peter 2.20. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall back into sin because it's easy. We have that war going on inside of us. And we had a funny video last week. Go online to Facebook. You'll see that. Or go on to the, to the thing. It was really cool. But you know what? There's a war going on inside of us. And it, it, it's there. And he knows we're going to mess up. But sanctification is a process that once you get saved and you spend your whole life trying to get better at it because you won't be fully sanctified, you won't be fully perfect until you get to one place and one place only, and that's heaven. Now, that's something that holds a lot of churches back is people think everybody in church should be perfect. Well, here's, what, here's what the world has to understand. We're a bunch of people striving to become better like God. But we know we're not going to be there until we get there. And if you think everybody's got to be perfect to be in church, you, you, you're not going to find that here on earth. We've got a bunch of imperfections among us all, pastor included. But you know what? God still loves us. But it's our job to get better and better. Now, um, we're getting ready for football season. Who's ready for football season? Who can't stand football season? Usually you're on one of the other two. Okay? You, you, you're on one of the two. Yesterday I went down to see Pitt play, and they, they played miserable. It was, I mean, it was... I never leave early. But I left early. It was so bad. I mean, they won in overtime, but they, they, they just, it was absolute, I mean, it was, I left early because I didn't want my, my heart couldn't take anymore. 
And my, my countenance couldn't take it anymore. And I wasn't going to be a Christian much longer if I stayed at the game. Okay, it was just, it just was, it just was, oh man, it was just so, they should blow that pony down. They played so terrible. And then, ugh, but get off. But next week starts the NFL. Who's ready for, yeah, the NFL's coming up. And, you know, around here, most people like the Steelers. I said most, so don't feel offended if I didn't call your team out. I'm a Steeler fan. And their coach is Mike Tomlin. And, he, and, and a lot of people like him. A lot of people hate him. There's even a website up called firemiketomlin.com, I think it's called. And, you know, everybody, no one like, if you're a leader, you're going to get shot at. It's just the way it is. But Mike Tomlin has a saying after every loss or every close game or something like this. He says this every week. He says, the standard is the standard. Now, what's that mean? That means is for the Steelers, the standard is one thing and one thing only, to win the championship. They had the most championships of any team in the NFL, so the standard is this is what we play at. And if we don't get there, we failed. But you know what? We're going to work every week to get there because the standard is the standard. And that's what God is saying. Perfection is the standard with God, but you know what? God is asking you. He knows you're not going to attain that to get to heaven. He understands that. But the standard is still the standard. It's our job to do our best to get closer to that. Does God know that we will have moments where we fail? Absolutely. Does God want you to feel bad about that? No. He understands that. He realizes that. You're human. What he wants you to do is to realize that every time you do fail, realize, just think about what Jesus did. How he pardons you. It should humble you and should also then motivate you to get better. And that's the point. Don't stay down. Get back up and keep getting better and better and better at it. The devil's going to say, see, you're a terrible person because you don't, you, you don't forgive like Jesus can. Let me tell you this right now. You can't forgive like Jesus can. But you can get better at it. You can get closer and closer and closer to it. So, so when I was doing this, some questions came up that people struggle with. And one is, how do you know when you pardon somebody? That's a good question. How do you know when you're practicing pardoning somebody? Because you know what? It's difficult. You know, how, how do I know I'm really doing the right thing? And, and God spoke to me, it's simply this. It's when you can, with a clear conscience, look at them as Jesus does as a child of God. Now, it doesn't mean that you've forgiven every, that you've done everything that hasn't been consequence of this. And that just means you can look at them as God looks at them, as a sinner who needs to be saved, someone needs to get fixed, that, that when they're fixed, that they're a child of God, an heir of everything. When you can look at that, that's what God wants you to get to. It doesn't mean you gloss over sin or don't do anything about the wrong or anything like that. All we're saying is, can you look at them that way? Because then, you know, when you look at them that way, you'll deal with their sin in a different way. Because there's a wrong way and a right way to deal with somebody who's fallen or someone who's lost. And if you do it the wrong way, you can push them further away from God. You know what? God doesn't come up to you and just bang on your head when you do something wrong. He wants to love you. He wants to bring you back into him. You know, and you, the only way you do it is because he always looks at you as who you always were created to be. That's why God can pardon like that. We can't because we're humans. We, we, we have this, this thing inside of us. We have a tough time with that. But once you know today, this is how you know you're on the right track. When you are making a conscious effort to look at them at who they could be in Jesus if this was out of their life. That's step one. Another thing is, well, do I just accept them, forget what they did, and restore them immediately to where they were? Well, that's a good question. Now, Jesus, as soon as we get saved, he restores us to what we're supposed to be. Oh, but you don't understand what's going on with this person in my life. They've done something. How, how do I do this and all that? Well, remember something. Don't beat yourself up about that. There's all kinds of verses in the Bible about Restoring the brother will take time. Galatians 6.1 is one of them. And it talks about how it's going to take some time to restore the brother. God knows that because you know what? Only God can forgive and forget. You can't. We can't. It's impossible. If you tell me you can forgive and forget, you're, you're wrong. You can't. It's not possible. It's just the way we are. We're not perfect. We are, we are a fallen creation. Okay? So you've got to understand, first of all, it's going to take time. Okay? And sometimes, and restoration doesn't always mean they get restored exactly where they were on this life. What God wants you to do is restore the fact that you can look at them the way they were for Jesus. That you can fellowship with them the way you're supposed to. The way you will in heaven one day with them. Because put it this way, if they're a Christian, they do something wrong to you, okay, they're still saved. Which means you're going to live forever with them in heaven. And God wants you to say, hey, you need to be able to get over that now because you're going to live with them forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in heaven. But God also realized we're human and it's going to take time. So if someone hurts you, and don't, 
God will say, well, see, you haven't forgiven them right away. You haven't pardoned them right away. God says, I understand. I know restoration can and will take time. So don't let the devil beat you up over that. The point is you need to be working towards it. The standard is the standard. And when I pardon, I think there should still be consequences. I heard that one. And God said, yes, yeah, but God, should it, do we just forgive him? You know, when Jesus forgives us, he forgives us, right? He doesn't typically have consequences for us right there and then. The consequence that we don't get forgiven is to go to hell. But you know what? Should there be consequences sometimes? And the answer is simply this. Yes, there should be consequences. But the question is, how are the consequences done? This is how you know if you're pardoning or not. And the first thing I remember this is the word is 100%. There's only one relationship in all the world that's 100% wrong and 100% right. And here's the, here it is. Jesus is 100% right and you're 100% wrong. Okay? That, that's it. If Jesus tells you you're doing something wrong, you are 100% wrong and he's 100% right. That's the only place where 100 and 0 go together. Because if he ain't 100% right, we in trouble. So no matter what relationship you're dealing with, there's always, a, it could be 99 to 1. There's always going to be that, you know, there's always going to be that because you've got to realize that you yourself are a sinner who was saved by God's grace. You can never forget that in your relationship. And that sometimes comes into the church. Well, I'm holier than thou. I'm, you know what, but you too were that person who needed to be pardoned just as much as the other person needed to be pardoned. There's only one relationship that's 100 to 0. But here's the deal. When you have consequences, Yes, there should be consequences of sin because the consequences are there because God wants to bring people in the right relationship. In the Bible, there's consequences to the people of God. There's things that happen, not because God wanted to punish, because he wanted to restore them in the right relationship. And that's the thing. When someone does something, you know, and it, there should be consequences. But are you doing it because you're doing it out of a spiteful, punishment, vengeful point of view? Or are you doing it because they need this in order to get back into God? Big difference. It's a huge difference. You know, the world, when it, when it wants to get wronged, righted, they want to punish. And they want to do it in a vengeful, vindictive way to put the other person down. God says, yeah, there should be consequences so they don't do the same thing in the future because that's not who they were created to be. And our job is to help everyone become who they were created to be in God. Which way are you punishing? Are you withholding something from somebody because you're punishing them or because they need to realize what they're doing wrong to get back to God? There's a big difference between the two. And it's a fine line. But perfection means you've got to walk a fine line, doesn't it? So don't think there shouldn't be that way. One of the good examples of this is in, in, in the Assemblies of God when the pastor messes up. You know, pastors mess up. Sometimes they mess up really bad. And we have a thing called pastoral reconciliation. <clears throat> and what it's designed for is when a pastor falls, they're supposed to submit to this, and it's for a period of usually two years, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on what happens. And they go through counseling, they go through different things that are happening, there's, depending on what they did, it determines what happens. I mean, there's not a set course for every single thing that happens. And then, when, and, then, and then when they go through, at the end of the time, the design of it is at the end, is that they can be restored back into ministry. But a lot of pastors look at pastoral reconciliation, and they, they look at it as punishment. Well, yeah, this happened to me, you should forgive me right now and then, and I should stay in my ministry because my ministry needs me, blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? That's not a humble spirit. Pastoral reconciliation in the Assemblies of God is not designed to hurt that pastor, but to help get that pastor fixed so we can have a career and be able to say, hey, this happened to me, but God forgave me and he can forgive you too. It could be a wonderful thing for a pastor. Not that he fell into it, but you know what? No one is beyond falling into sin. If anybody ever tells you that, they, 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 they are way messed up. No one is beyond falling into the temptation of sin. And even in that video we saw today, that boy, he, he had to go to prison for a while. He had to do, he had to, he had to have, there were consequences to it. It didn't just happen overnight that the guy was restored back in, but the man in the video, he had his eyes on Jesus. It was tough for him. I, trust me, that seven minutes doesn't capitulate everything that happened in there. It took years for that to happen. And there should, sometimes there are punishment. But when you're dealing with someone who has wronged you, consider the, cons the consequence that you will require. Are you doing it to punish them? Or are you doing it because they need that in order for them to see what they did wrong so they can become right? There's a big difference between the two. 
as it leads us to this thing here, because another struggle is, you know, it's, it's also a problem, you know, it's a problem with our jail system in America. What happens? We, we, we send people to jail, but instead of, you know, we say we want to rehabilitate and all that, you know, really we should be trying to restore them. But they come back out and then they go back in right again because really nothing has happened because there's not a lot of care going into there. It's not about, you know, we, you know they're, they're, they're a terrible person. They're always going to be a terrible person. You know what, God, that's the way you were when you were a sinner. God always treated you as a terrible person. God never treated you as a terrible person, but you were because you were in sin. But God looked on you what you could be. And brings us to the last one. What if the other person doesn't care about pardoning? What if the other person doesn't care about being reconciled? What if the other person doesn't care that what they're doing to me is hurting me? And, and, and they still keep doing it. Why should I pardon that person? Why should I practice this? I, I, I can pardon them in my heart, but they, they still keep doing this over and over again, and they don't realize what they're doing wrong. And, and, and now I, it feels like I'll be abused, and I'll feel like I'm taken advantage of because I'm the one going to them. They never did anything towards me, and this isn't fair. Before I go any further, this guy here, Jesus, and there's 7.6 billion people in the world and less than a billion claim to be Christians. So that means there's 6 billion people down here who are taking advantage of him, mocking his name, doing those things. But he's still there ready to pardon any moment. And that's the message we need to give. But at the same time, you can't live up to that standard yet. But we need to work to that standard. So what do I do about that? Well, it says in Matthew 7, 14 and 15, it says this, If you forgive men their trespasses on earth, your Father God will forgive you in heaven. And in 15 says, If you don't forgive their trespasses, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. And then what does trespasses mean? Trespass is a very important word here. Okay? It means intentional sin. It means you intentionally meant to do that. When you trespass against something, it wasn't unintentional, it was intentional. And, and, and you know, if we don't do that... If we don't forgive them, the God will not forgive us. But at the same time, but how do I do this? How do I, I don't want to get my heart get squished on all the time and all that. Well, let me tell you something. God does not want you to be a doormat. And pardoning, if you do it the wrong way, can lead you to feeling like a doormat. God doesn't want you to feel like a doormat. And he has, and he has a verse in Titus chapter 3.10. It says this, After the first and second warning, when you find a disrupted brother, then you should disfel disfellowship with that brother. Now, what's going on here is Titus was having some issues in his church. And so Paul wrote him this letter called Titus. He said, you know what? Warn him once, warn him twice. At the second warning, go ahead and separate from one another. And why was that? Because God knows that we as humans, we're dealing with other humans. And we're all have fallen. We've all had problems. We've all had things happen to us. And some will respond well and some won't. And God never says, a Christian, we're supposed to be a doormat and feel used and abused. You know what happens if we feel like that? Eventually we'll start walking away from God because like, why serve God? I mean, I just feel crappy all the time. God doesn't want that. So there's rules besides Titus. There's other ones in the Bible. And take a couple classes back there and you'll, you'll find a bunch of them. But you know what? God says, you know what? I want you to practice the parting lifestyle, but if it's not received, because you know what? Part of the parting style is you have to go talk to the person. You have to go meet with them. What if they don't want to do it? You can't control the other person. Only one person you can control, and that's yourself. And if they don't receive, they don't want to go through the process, they don't want to have that, at least you've done your part, you're doing what you can do. God only asked you to do your best. He didn't say to be a doormat and be walked all over either. If something happens, hey, God gives reasons for that. And I think sometimes we get it, you know, we're supposed to all be lovey-dovey. We're supposed to be like that, but sometimes love has to be shown in different ways. But the point is, God wants you to be able to practice a parting lifestyle that doesn't also destroy you. Because if you go far, too far one way, it can destroy you. Because then you feel like this doormat, for lack of a better word. So in conclusion today, you know, a lot of people struggle with this. You know, we got to live like Jesus. This is what Jesus did. And, you know, we got to, we got to do, we, we, in Matthew 5, 4, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, that's a tough verse. And the point of the day is if you struggle with that, it's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. It actually makes you a better person because you know what? If you're struggling with it, it means you're trying to deal with it. You're trying to become better. It's a good thing. It means you're on the right track. And also, when you think about it, when you struggle with that, when you deal with somebody else, and what would Jesus do, you really appreciate more what 
he does for you each and every time he forgives you. You got to think about it. Imagine if he was not fully human and fully God. If he was just fully human, you, you, he couldn't do what he did. He's God. He's the almighty creator of the world. Read John chapter 1. And only he can pardon immediately. And he, only he can forgive and forget. Now, it makes me appreciate what he does for me more. And when you appreciate that more to help you how you look at other people. Help you walk through life a lot better too. Help when people are on your case about things to realize, well, you know what, they really need Jesus too. It'll help you with that. And, God, and remember this, God knows that you can't do this immediately like him. He doesn't expect you to. And sometimes in the Christian faith we put, well, you got to be, you got to change immediately like this to be like God. Well, no, that's not the case. Sanctification is a progressive process. Being perfect, you're not going to be there until you get to heaven. It's a progressive process. The point is you got to be on a journey at some point in your life. And everybody's going to be at different stages on that journey, and it's okay. The key is you need to be on the journey. You can't be sitting on the sideline. You can't be just standing still. You have to be always moving toward God. And as you do, you know what's going to happen? God's going to help you. Because if God wants you to be perfect, the only, one, only one person can help you get perfect. That's the perfect one. You want to see God move in your life. You want to see God bless you. You want to see the Spirit move in your life. You start doing the things that Jesus does, and guess what? He's going to help you with it. But I fail sometimes. He knows you will. I fail. Everybody fails. But Jesus says, Keep trying your best to get better at it. That's all he asks. Sometimes we make Christianity seem really hard to do, to attain. Jesus wants you to be in heaven. He wants your life to be full. He wants your life to be blessed. And he realizes where you are. Remember a few weeks ago, he understands you. And he'll help you along the way. And last but not least, don't be a doormat. Don't let anybody be a doormat. Don't get to the point where, well, I forget everybody. I can't hate it. No. There will be times that people don't receive it. doesn't mean you still can't have the attitude of a partner. Remember, it's seeing them how Jesus saw them despite their sin. It will help you deal with it better. might not be accomplished in this life. Because, you know, you can't control the other person. You can only control yourself. But we need to live a pardoning lifestyle because this is what Jesus does first and foremost. You know, people want all the glitz and glamour of, of Christianity. They, they want the healings. They want the miracles. They want this and that. But you know what? His first and foremost priority is this. He pardons you. That is priority number one. Because you know what? You can have all the healings you want. You can have all the miracles you want. You can have all the messages in tongues you want. You can have all the, the messages of knowledge you want. All the stuff that the Bible says you can have. But if you don't get pardoned by Jesus Christ, it don't mean anything. Because where you end up, is the most important thing. And when you live a part in life, so all those things you want to see happen will happen. If our church, we're going to talk about these three C's, how we want to be and portray ourselves, but we also got to know, number, the number one thing is, we want you to know when you come to Jesus Christ, he pardons you. And if we as a church, we're going to do our best to live that way, and we're going to be up front with you, we're not going to be perfect. We are going to make some mistakes. We know we're going to try our best to do what we can because we want to move forward and not just sit still. I think that's what holds back a lot of churches is that we say a lot of these things, but we don't actually put them in action. And then we don't put them in action because, well, we failed here, so we, we can't do it anymore, so God must not like us. No, God knows you're going to do things. He knows you're going to fail. He knows things are going to happen. It's okay. Just go to God. He'll give you the answers. He'll tell you what to do. He'll help you live the life that you're supposed to live. The devil's one saying, oh, look how bad you are. But I'm not to that level yet. That's the devil saying that. God takes you where you are. All he asks you to do is remember that the standard is the standard. And do your best to live to that standard. Now, that might require change on your part. And it, well, I'll tell you right now, it will. It's required change on my part. But here's the deal. Some people might happen overnight. Some people might not. The point is God is with you. And God will help you get, take that next step. Because you know what? He's not there to, to stand with a hammer and say, oh, look how bad you are. He's there to say, hey, I want you to get closer to me. If he wants to get close to you, he's going to help you get closer to him. He's not going to push you further away. That's the devil that does that. And this is what we have to have happen to see God move in our lives. So does that kind of make a little more sense to everybody in the room? 
I said, I, I, last week it kind of was a really somber tone. And I said, yeah, maybe you go out and need to pardon somebody. We should probably, maybe some of us still do, need to. I know there's another person I need to go to. But, you know, it, it's, we struggle with this. Good thing he doesn't. <laughs> but it makes you appreciate so much more what this cross means. We take great pains to unveil the cross in here so we see it all the time. Because that's what it's about. What he did on that cross pardons us from all of our sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And it's our job now to imitate that. The best we can. He's not asking you to be Jesus. Okay? You can't be Jesus. But you can shine his light out. You can imitate him. And today, I might not have answered all the questions, because you know what? This is just something that came across the way, and I asked God for the answers. This is what God gave me. I think if we do that, you'll see a change in your life. It'll also help you walk through life better, because you know you're always going to have people that don't like you. You're always going to have people that are going to come against you. You're always going to have people that do wrong to you. But if you can practice this, you can look beyond that and be able to do that. What that guy in the video did, I guarantee you, I mean, he, he's... he's He's in his 50s. I guarantee you he was 20. He couldn't do the same thing he did now. He's spent a whole life following Jesus Christ. Our life is a journey. But the number one thing we have to be about is we have to realize this is what Jesus did for you. He didn't just forgive you. He pardoned you and made you an heir of everything that he has. It's a huge concept. And he says you've got to be like him. You've got to be perfect. The Heavenly Father isn't perfect. He's not saying you have to be that and you don't go to heaven. He says, this is what you got to work towards. I think that's sometimes in Christianity we get people say that we don't have them work towards anything. God wants to make you better. He wants to make you something. You want to see, people say, I want to see all the great things that God did in the Bible and Acts. He can do that, but the number one thing is the number one thing. you got to have a pardoning spirit to bother the people. Now, like I said, doesn't mean you, you, you gloss over the sin. Doesn't mean you, there's not consequences. I didn't say that. Because there will be. But how you treat the sin, how you do the consequence, and all that will come from the way you look at them. There's a big difference on how you deal with that, whether it's coming from your flesh or whether it's coming through Jesus Christ moving through your flesh towards that. So before we go there, I'm not having an altar call today. But I was wanted to ask, is, is anybody having any, this is a deep subject. I've struggled with this for the last four weeks. Does anybody have a question they, they want to ask or a comment? I mean, like I said, I'm not Jesus. I'm just doing what he asked me to do. Anybody have anything they want to? Yeah, go ahead, Joyce. And that's, and that's what we got to portray to other people. How much Jesus loved me, how much we love him, and that's how we're supposed to look at them because we, before, we were, before we came to know him, we were the sinner we're looking at. We were the person that did the wrong, but every time we come to him, he pardons us right away. Anybody else? This is a safe place. No one's, I'm not going to say, you're a terrible person for saying that, Okay. But I want you to get this concept down pat because we, we need to, before we go forward to the church, we got to get priority one down pat, which is we're more focused on where they are now than on what they're doing now, where they're going to go one day. That's got to be the focus. Because that's the reason he did all he did. If that's not priority number one, then we got our priorities out of order. Does that make sense? And everything else flows from there. You want to see the gifts. You want to see the things move. You want to see the lost come here. Jesus needs to know that we can practice that. And also towards one another. Because we're all going to do things to one another that we don't like or things like that. But can we look at them as Jesus looks at them? And you'll deal with your brother and sister better. You'll deal with your coworker better. You'll deal with your boss better. You'll deal with your children better. Doesn't mean it always work out on this earth. Because you can't control the other person. But all you can control is yourself. If you do that, God then will step in and fight your battles for you. Do the things that need to be done. Last chance. Anybody else want to say anything? Yes, Roger.
God never says Christians, we, we, we're supposed to rise up in power, right? We're supposed to be soldiers for Jesus Christ. Soldiers aren't supposed to be wimpy things. But our weapon is different than the earthly world. And, and, and our weapon is this word called pardon. It's a powerful thing. When used properly, it can change everything. And, and I think that's what's wrong with the church world. What's wrong... Oh, well, I'll forgive you, but, you know, I, I can't stand you because of what you do. Well, no, no, no. Forgiving doesn't mean just saying you're forgiven. It means you've got to make effort. The standard is always going to be the standard for Jesus Christ. And the closer you get to the standard, the more God will move in your life. The more things will happen, and the more he'll defend you. The more he'll show up in your life. Because a lot of people are searching for a lot of different things. There's people searching for spirituality. There's people searching for moves of this and moves of that and running after this and that or the latest thing. But you know what? The latest thing is the thing that's always been around. It's called that cross right there. That must never, ever, 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 get this? Get old. If that message gets old, we we, we out we of focus. <laughs> And then why would God show up? We get this right. We get this idea, not just forgiving, but pardoning. We're going to be able to move mountains like we've never moved before. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time, these last couple weeks, Lord. And Because, Lord, my desire is to see you be glorified here. Lord, it's not our church. It's your church, Lord. We just want to be your servants. And more important than anything else, we want to be more like you. And we realize that we're not going to be more like, we're not going to be exactly like you until we get to heaven and we have our glorified body and there's no more sin and no more sickness and no more bad things. But Lord, I ask you to pray of each and every one in this room that we can get closer to you on a daily basis. That we can pardon like you pardon. But Lord, we also realize, Lord, in our humanity, Lord, there's going to be frailties, there's going to be failings, there's going to be sin around. But Lord, all you ask of us is to do the best that we can and to keep going on the journey and getting closer and closer to you and lean on you to help us in the situation. Because there's going to be sometimes where it's going to be really hard to pardon somebody. It's going to be really hard to do that to that person to go to them. We don't know what's going to happen with them, but you know what? We know what will happen with us when we do it because we'll be liberated. Our spirit will be cleansed. And we'll see them the way Jesus saw them. And, and then, yeah, there might be times where we have consequences and we have to do something t- and, and, and put them through something. But we're not doing it because we're being vindictive. We're doing it because we know they need to go through that in order to come back to Jesus Christ and be who they could be, who Jesus saw them to be. And just bless us, Lord, as we deal with all the people in our lives, whether it's work, co-workers, or family, or, or people at, at school for the teens in the room, or whatever's going on. Because when we do that, we're going to the heart of it all. Because priority number one is making sure people get into heaven. And if we got that down, Pat, and we're looking at it the way you look at them, all the other things you say in your word that will happen will happen because that's what you want to see happen because they're there to help us bring people to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. He said, next week we're going to start a new series, C3. We're going to talk about what we, what, what we need to be. But before we started it, I really felt we needed to get, kind of get this concept down, Pat. Does that make sense? Hope you understand how that helps put a light on this and also help us deal with each other. And when you're doing it, ask God for help. You can call, you have questions, call me. I mean, that's what I'm here for as a pastor. I'm here to shepherd and help you. I'm also here to push you to another level. And that's what this does. Pardoning pushes us out of our comfort zone a little bit. Well, for me, it pushes me a lot out of my comfort zone. But you know, when we do that, then God follows and amazing things happen. I don't know about you, I want to see the amazing thing happen. But my, prior, my focus, priority number one, is I want to see people realize that Jesus pardons them. He doesn't just forgive the lost. He doesn't just forgive the backsliding person. He forgives, forgets, and gives them a full pardon. Isn't that great? And if we get that down pat, and that's the message we preach, that's the message we share by how we do things, and they'll see it by how you deal with people that wrong you. Because then you're showing them Jesus and how you deal with it. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.